I will now welcome Dr. Patrice Lindsay, Director of Systems Change and Stroke Program here at Heart and Stroke. Good afternoon and good morning, everybody from coast to coast. Thank you very much for joining us today for our next installment in our webinar series. Today, we're going to talk about the impact of sleep on vascular health. These are unprecedented times, and we appreciate everybody making the time to be with us today. Our learning objectives for today are to really understand what the evidence is related to sleep and vascular health, to talk about strategies for assessing sleep health and sleep disorders, and to identify and apply management plans to help your patients to address their sleep and to optimize their health. We are very fortunate today to have with us Dr. Mark Bullis. Mark is a staff neurologist and an expert in stroke and sleep at the Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre and an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Mark is very popular and has presented for us in other venues and is always um, presenting to a full house. Today is no exception. So Mark, thank you very much. Before we start, we want to point out to you a few things that have happened given everything going on with COVID in the last several weeks. First of all, yesterday, we have released a Canadian Stroke Best Practice Statement about COVID and how to manage acute stroke, stroke prevention, and stroke rehab during these unprecedented times. Please take the time to go to our Best Practice website and to look at this statement and to understand what changes you might need to do or to adapt to ensure that we continue to give optimal stroke care to all of our patients, even now. Within the Heart and Stroke website, we have been monitoring this COVID and stroke and heart disease and vascular cognitive impairment evidence for several weeks now. We continue to update our information and to provide reliable and credible information for patients and for healthcare providers. Please check out our site and encourage your patients when they are looking for information. We're also doing several other podcasts, webinars. We've got lots of printed materials and infographics, and we're in the middle of publishing scientific papers. So please let us know if there's anything we can do to help you as you support your patients, your coworkers, and look after yourself during this unprecedented time. Thank you very much for that. I will now pass it over to Mark Bullis to talk about sleep and vascular health. Thank you very much, Patty, for the very kind introduction. I really thank the organizers for the wonderful opportunity to present on this topic. Of course, it's a ma major passion of mine. And also want to thank all of you. These are very difficult times. I thank everyone for joining us uh, today, and I really hope you enjoy the webinar. We can answer as many questions at the end as possible. And also feel free to follow me as well on uh, on Twitter, as as also uh, just I tweet a lot about this topic. Of course, now given these unusual times with COVID-19, it's uh, it's very hard almost to think of anything else. But thank you again for joining. So. What we'll uh, what we'll do is we'll discuss. So we'll we'll discuss as as uh, already outlined. We'll discuss the relationship between stroke and sleep disorders, as well as cardiovascular and, and uh, cardiovascular disease and sleep disorders, and also um, and also ways we can assess for these different diseases and finally treatment strategies for them. So uh, so Kirsten, I just need to be able to advance my slides for you. Okay. Thank you. So I do want to disclose some um, in-kind support I've received from different companies, uh, particularly in the sleep world, as well as also some peer-reviewed uh, funding sources as well from different agencies through different grants I've been fortunate to receive. So this is the outline that we've already discussed that will discuss different sleep disorders such as sleep apnea, abnormal sleep architecture, as well as also talk about different ways that we can assess for sleep disorders and finally management approaches. So let's first talk about sleep apnea. What is sleep apnea? Sleep apnea is when, uh, you know, normally when you breathe at night, the airway just goes right through your oropharynx, absolutely unobstructed. The airway, air can go right in. In, in cases of obstructive sleep apnea, for whatever reason, the air is actually being obstructed and cannot enter the oral pharynx. This gives rise to actually a large number of uh, physiological consequences. So, and also a large number of symptoms. So for example, snoring, daytime sleepiness, you might, your bed partner might actually see you stop breathing in your sleep. Awakenings uh, in the middle of sleep due to choking or gasping as well as morning headaches. However, it's important to note that in our vascular populations, patients may present atypically. Uh, as a stroke neurologist who specializes in sleep disorders, 
I'm actually often surprised, but it's not that surprising when you think about it, that uh, patients will report that their snoring has decreased since the time they've had their stroke. And I think that's probably because the airways have actually laxed or they've become a little bit more relaxed uh, post-stroke, given often the oral pharyngeal weakness we may see in different stroke presentations. So again, it's important to note that these are the typical symptoms, but in the, in the vascular population, we very much may see uh, atypical presentations. So the, the, the symptoms and the signs that we've just discussed can give rise to a large number of physiological consequences. And these include oxygen desaturation. So you can just imagine your bed partner, God forbid, is choking you every night, grabbing their hands around your neck. Sounds funny. It's not. It has major physiological consequences. Arousals from sleep, which would be um, basically awakenings from sleep. E e physiologically, their EEG changes, meaning that your brain is waking up. It's not continuing in the normal, uh, not the continuing in normal sleep. It's having very choppy, fragmented sleep. And finally, also intrathoracic pressure changes. And so these give rise actually to a large number of mechanisms, such as, you know, uh, a lot of things you've probably heard of before, sympathetic activation, endothelial dysfunction, hypercoagulability, inflammation, oxidative stress, and metabolic dysregulation. And so from physiological grounds, you, we, uh, we can see that, you know, sleep apnea can give rise to stroke, myocardial infarction, heart failure, systemic hypertension, arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation, which of course carry great consequence in the vascular world, and unfortunately even sudden death. So a lot of clinical studies have borne out what we already know physiologically. So the first study that really put obstructive sleep apnea on the map was published out of the group from Harvard. And they looked at a thousand patients and basically controlled for everything that you could think of, age, gender, and so on and so forth, lots of different vascular risk factors. And they were able to demonstrate about 15 years ago, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, that if you had sleep apnea, that you, you had independently uh, an, uh, an independent risk, increased risk for stroke and for death. Likewise, subsequent excellent papers have also shown the same relationship with stroke, that again, moderate to severe sleep apnea is linked with an increased risk of stroke. It's not only for cerebral vascular events, it's also for cardiovascular events as well, including myocardial infarction and vascular risk factors such as hypertension and atrial fibrillation, as we've already discussed briefly, with all very good, excellent observational work been, been, been done here. So just a little trivia for you here. We can put on that uh, poll, uh, Kirsten. What percentage of patients have obstructive sleep apnea after stroke or TIA? Unfortunately, I can't vote, but take your pick here. There's four options there, and we'll read the results. All right, maybe we can put up the results. All right, I think you guys are pretty close. Um, that's great. So the answer is actually 70%, all right? And uh, maybe I could just go back to my slides here. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks so much. So in a meta-analysis of more than 2,300 stroke and TIA patients, in fact, 72% of patients had an AHI of greater than 5, and that would be the de definition of what sleep apnea is. The AHI is the number of times you stop breathing in sleep per hour. And it's important to note that sleep apnea in the stroke population is linked, as also in the cardiovascular population, but it's linked with poor outcomes such as longer hospitalizations, poor functional status and cognition, recurrent vascular events and morbidity and mortality. So in conclusion, just to wrap up our relationship between sleep apnea and vascular disease, it's very important to note that sleep apnea is an independent risk factor for stroke and for cardiovascular events, as well as their vascular risk factors such as hypertension and atrial fibrillation. Let's talk, let's take a step away now from sleep apnea and talk about other sleep problems. Let's talk about abnormal sleep architecture. Unfortunately, a lot of us have it, unfortunately being in the healthcare work. 
and dealing with very, very, very stressful times. So a lot of us do shift work. Let's put up a little trivia question here. Um, if you don't mind running that poll, perfect. So what are the consequences of shift work? So feel free to answer the question and we'll review that after. Great, so can we put that result? Let's see what it shows. Yeah, you guys got it right. Perfect, excellent, that's right. So unfortunately, shift work, which, you know, in our line of work is often absolutely necessary, is actually linked with all the above and even other things too. So what are the consequences of shift work? Well, acutely, you know, as you or I may have, you know, you're on call one night, busy call, see lots of patients through the night, never really get enough sleep. You just get an acute sleep loss. And also over the years, over the years, you can eventually develop chronic sleep loss. And these have a lot of effects on us, regrettably, including workplace accidents, diabetes, weight gain, coronary artery disease, stroke, even cancer outside of the vascular front here with, with again, pretty strong epidemiological evidence. Um, insomnia. Insomnia is where you can't initiate or maintain sleep. Initial insomnia, by definition, is an inability to initiate sleep, and um, middle insomnia is the inability to maintain sleep. <clears throat> and, you know, this is pretty common, it occurs in 10 to 20 percent of the population, but some people actually have a chronic course. Insomnia itself is also linked with a lot of, a lot of vascular consequences, such as hypertension, coronary artery disease acute coronary syndrome and heart failure, especially with shorter sleep times. An interesting paper was published at the end of last year that looked at genetic predisposition to insomnia or this genetic, what they call genetic liability to insomnia, and found that that was actually linked with ischemic stroke, coronary artery disease, and heart failure. So again, the whole thing about just not getting enough sleep or having poor quality sleep is again, very important in linking to vascular events and risk factors. So, the the um the national foundations like the national sleep foundation again these are based out of the states and also the american academy of sleep medicine recommends that everyone gets about seven to nine hours of sleep it's pretty well established in the literature now that sleeping less than six hours or six or seven hours depending on the study most studies use six hour cutoff though and so getting not enough sleep is linked with heart disease and stroke early death, diabetes, hypertension, weight gain, obesity, depression, not surprisingly, and also in things like impaired immune function, increased pain, and impaired performance, increased errors, more accidents. But it's not about getting too little sleep, it's also about getting too much sleep. So sleeping eight, more than eight or nine hours per night is associated with heart disease and stroke. Now, obviously, one has to be careful on what we say here because if you're sick, God forbid, you, you get an illness like the flu, God forbid, or COVID-19, or you're in bed, or you break your back or something, you, you, have, you break a bone, then sleeping more than eight or nine hours per night is appropriate, is appropriate as your body recovers. But outside of being sick, per se, or dealing with an underlying medical condition, like an acute medical condition, you shouldn't be sleeping more than eight, or hours, eight to nine hours per night on a regular basis. Obviously, to catch up with your sleep, that may be appropriate. So... Other literature has actually looked at the duration of naps and napping for more than an hour a day was initially shown to be uh, associated with all cause mortality and cardiovascular events, whereas napping less than an hour a day didn't really show too much association. However, a study again recently published last year, a pretty large study, demonstrated that the best amount of sleep you can get for yourself is getting around six to eight hours of hours per sleep, which is basically in line with with the, uh, with the academy recommendations. If you sleep more than six hours per night and you nap, that's associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events and death. If you sleep less than six hours per night and you get then some napping, in fact, you, you negate the association with, so there is no increased risk of cardiovascular events and deaths. So that's kind of interesting that people perhaps who don't get enough sleep 
uh, a nap may actually be beneficial uh, in that case. So just to summarize here on the relationship again between sleep, abnormal sleep architecture and vascular events, it's important to note and just to remember that shift work insomnia, long and sleep, uh, long and short sleep duration are associated with unfavorable health consequences, including stroke and heart disease. If you wanna stay perfect from your sleep, if you can get six to eight hours of good quality sleep, that's typically associated with the lowest risk of cardiovascular events and death. But sleeping more than six hours per night and then regularly napping is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events and death. So that's sort of the overview talking about the relationship between sleep, different sleep disorders and vascular events. There's a lot of more other things we can cover maybe in uh, at another time. But I'm gonna move on now to how can we detect sleep disorders and really objective measures or objective approaches to detecting sleep disorders. So that's a picture of me wearing one of my home sleep apnea tests. I'll talk about that more in a couple of minutes in my office, which I haven't seen now for about a week or two. <laughs> so well, when we run a study, we basically, you know, just like any other area of medicine, we want to ask simple questions. You know, does this patient have sleep apnea? Do they have abnormal sleep architecture? And that will address kind of our, the first two sections we talked about. So for sleep apnea, you know, and, and if really for any sleep problem, we've traditionally been using a lot of in-laboratory polysomnography. So this is where they stick lots of wires in your head, your face, your chest, and other spots of your body. It, it's the gold standard. It's, it's our industry standard right now to diagnose sleep problems. There are challenges, though, with polysomnography. It's quite expensive. Wait times can be long. Patients often don't want to go to the sleep lab. And it's not really the person's true sleep. It's not really their natural environment. So uh, just in case you were wondering, we have published on uh, normative sleep values in, in laboratory polysomnography. So for example, um, you know, what, how much sleep, in, if you go to the sleep lab, how much sleep should you be getting, how many, how much time in every different sleep stage should you be obtaining and so on. And if you go to psgnorms.com, uh, this is a paper that I worked on with a with a large number of very talented collaborators, and we published it last year in the Lancet Rest for Medicine. Uh, this, this website here is, is uh, would tell you what's basically a normal sleep study for your age and for your sex. But outside from clinical, using a full in-lab test, you can use what we call a home sleep apnea test. I'm gonna just give you a quick primer on different sleep studies here. So the level one, level one sleep studies are are those that have at least seven channels. And that sounds pretty complicated, but basically when you go to a lab and you get wired up with everything, that's basically what they're doing. It's what it's basically the technical term is level one. Level two is the same thing, but you can do it at home or in a lab. Level three is what I'm gonna focus on. on. Level three is kind of like a, a dumbed down version of a level one or level two. So it only has about four channels. It's pretty easy to put on and it can be used in a home or a lab setting. Now, typically if you're gonna use it, you're gonna use it at home. There's no point to go to a full lab and, and, and um, a full lab setup and, and, and use a level three there. And then level four, just in case you're interested, it would be just a single channel, like when you run an oximetry, uh, just like an oximeter or something like that. Okay. So level three has actually been the focus of some of my research work, and I'll talk about that very briefly right now. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of different level threes, and I'm just showing you everyone that's on the market that I'm aware of, of which I've already disclosed that I do have some in-kind support for. But again, in fact, my I, I lost money in running research and lose money, continue to lose money in my billings because the government does not actually support the use of these in Ontario. So when I order a home sleep apnea test, I actually am losing the money that I would have obtained from ordering an in-laboratory study. So in fact, I'm disclosing it as, a, as, a, as in-kind support, but in fact, it is harmful to me. It's not of benefit to me uh, because I'm not actually making, I'm, not, I'm, I'm losing money on these things. I have in-kind support, I've not received any financial support from companies to use these. Um, but the, the bottom line is that these are generally accurate as reviewed uh, in the CMAJ a number of years ago. And, you know, I, I really feel that they are more of a gold standard of what we're trying to measure here. So. You know, in the lab, no one's gonna show up with their alcohol that they might be using at home, no recreational drug use. And you know, the effects of things like cannabis are not really well appreciated in sleep, but there probably is an effect. 
you're not usually sleeping in your usual sleep position. Often people in the lab are forced to sleep on their back. Now you're probably getting better sleep because you're not stuck with a whole bunch of wires. It's just a bunch. It's pretty simple as you can see, just a scimitar or something around the chest and something on the finger here. And you're probably sleeping a little bit more. So you're probably getting a better sleep duration. So the level three, these level three home sleep mapping tests, I would say are likely, you know, are, are sort of uh, approaching more of what your real sleep is. And they're also convenient and it's your typical sleep environment. So I think it makes for an overall better test in my opinion. Um, they're also cheaper. So these tests you can see here again, I'm just showing you every one that's in the market that I'm aware of, but they could range from around two to $6,000. And then once you bought it once, you can use the um, you can use the uh, you can use nasal cannula or, or batteries that basically run every test for less than five dollars once you actually have the equipment. Um, and comparing that to the level one, again level one, remember you were being used multiple times a week, almost every day, probably every day of the week, but they're expensive, thirty to fifty thousand dollars. There's a technical fee, and this is I think approximately the amount OHIP pays the lab. And then 90 bucks goes to the doctor to review the report and oversee the study. So previous work outside of the vascular population has shown that you could save about $5,000 to $1,000, say $500 to $1,000 per patient if you can move both the testing for sleep disorders and uh, titration of CPAP outside of the laboratory. All right. Um, so overall, so overall, these home tests are accurate. They're convenient for patients. They, they, I think they simulate a more natural environment and more natural home environment and there are cost savings. So much so that the American Academy of Sleep Medicine actually in their own guidelines said that home sleep apnea tests help provide physicians with high quality patient-centered care for select adults who are suspected of sleep apnea. And our population that we're looking after here, the stroke and cardiovascular population are at very high risk for sleep apnea. And they, and this, and home sleep apnea tests may actually be shown to be a benefit in these populations. So there's a trial I ran, still working on publishing it, or just, I was actually just working on the manuscript yesterday. Um, but we randomized recently 250 patients who have been recruited from our Sunnybrook Stroke Clinic or the inpatient unit. And basically we randomized them. So I uh, work with an excellent research team. They randomized the patients to either a home sleep apnea test or a standard of care. And in the home sleep apnea test arm, patients were given the home sleep apnea test and in the standard of care arm they're given uh, in laboratory or they were given the option to use in laboratory polysomnography and we looked at primary and secondary, secondary objectives if anyone at any point of the study was diagnosed and neither arm was diagnosed with um, sleep apnea they were started on CPAP basically in the order of weeks and what we found not surprisingly is that uh, compared to using the in laboratory sleep test patients in the home sleep apnea test arm had increased diagnosis of sleep apnea. They were more likely to be treated with CPAP. They had reduced daytime sleepiness and they actually had a greater ability to perform daily activities and other positive functional outcomes in the stroke impact scale. We also did a formal cost effectiveness analysis and showed that this was actually a cost effective approach. So again, these home tests are not being used right now, but I think there's something that has to be seriously considered for the future. It has to be worked into government models, particularly on Ontario, probably other spots too across Canada. The last thing I want to talk about very briefly is wrist dictigraphy because we talked about sleep architecture already. Um, and wrist dictigraphy is kind of like your Fitbit type, uh, you know, little wristwatch. And they they basically they're little devices that they 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 look at raw activity scores, and they have the ability to sort of through these proprietary algorithms, they have the ability to get a sense for are you sleeping? Are you awake? Are you moving around? And so on and so forth. There's a lot of them on the market. They're pretty cheap compared to like other stuff, especially things like the detect sleep apnea. They're only about $100 to $1,500 per, per device. And you can measure multiple nights over time. It's kind of cool. You get a nice uh, feedback and nice printout. And you can have, like I have for some of my studies, we have like weeks of data. And it's beautiful for just for a single patient. You can get weeks of data, which is something you could never get using an in-lab approach or even a home home sleep apnea test approach. Uh, but you can see over here that what time the patient went to bed, what time they woke up, whether they had fragmented sleep. So quite a beautiful tracing here. And these two are accurate. They're convenient for patients. There's not a problem for someone to wear it on the wrist for a long time. 
natural uh, natural environments and, and cost savings for CERTA compared to laboratory policy market group. So that's great. So we've discussed kind of how there are different, you know, the different links between some sleep disorders and vascular disease. And uh, we've talked about how can we assess for them. Now we're going to talk about how can we manage them, which is, of course, probably top on everyone's mind. And then I'd be very happy to take uh, some questions at the end. All right, so let's talk about treating sleep apnea. Um, so the, the typical thing is, you know, you know, it depends on how severe sleep apnea is. So some patients, I remember I had a patient a couple of years ago who lost about 10% of her body weight and with exercise and with healthy diet and was actually able to eliminate her sleep apnea. So that's, I don't see that all that much, but I do see it once in a while. I had one patient who was regrettably uh, had a very heavy consumption of alcohol and I convinced him to go abstinence. So he actually, believe it or not, he actually listened to me and his sleep apnea went away as well. So there are some things like obesity, excessive alcohol use that could be pretty, not easily addressed, but can be addressed. And in the right motivated patient, they, this can actually make a major difference. Some patients only have their sleep apnea or have the worst of their sleep on, your back, on their back. And so we generally advise patients to avoid sleeping on their back. Uh, and people who don't like CPAP, we can use a mandibular advancement device. This basically pushes the lower jaw forward and it has to be set up by a good dentist. So if you're doing this line of work, find a good dentist in your area who has a good reputation and uh, and that's uh, the best way to go. And I work actually just with you know, one or two dentists in Toronto uh, who I fully, fully trust. Uh, and then finally CPAP, which is, you know, she usually gets most of the uh, attention for patients. And uh, it is kind of the gold standard here. So this is the first line therapy here for moderate to severe sleep apnea. But there are challenges with CPAP. We have to be very open about it, which is it needs to be titrated fit and managed closely. And you know, people really struggle, especially initially with CPAP. So I really tell people to try different brands, different masks of the CPAP devices, especially different masks. And uh, just to find something that actually fits on their face. I tell people while they're watching TV to actually put their CPAP on even before they're in bed, just so they get used to how it feels like on their face. And they should do that for many hours. I know it sounds goofy, but at least they get they get comfortable with how the CPAP fits and feels on their face before they go to bed. Some patients also struggle with adherence because of congestion and irritation. So some people really, it really, I got really, it takes a lot of coaching a lot of follow-up, a lot of encouragement, but you can have happy outcomes here in a carefully selected picture. But however, he's demonstrated poor sleep hygiene by using a tablet in bed, unfortunately, but at least he's using a CPAP. Um, and observational work, and I'll share with you um, the randomized literature in a couple of minutes here, but basically <clears throat> in patients after stroke, uh, if they were compliant with CPAP, their blood pressure dropped, they had increased well-being, they had reduced vascular events, reduced five-year mortality. Factors affecting um, CPAP compliance uh, are, are variable in the literature, but things like early compliance, and uh, actually our lab published on a paper recently looking at actually that people who were actually better off, greater functional capacity, less daytime fatigue, actually were more likely to be compliant with it. So there's different, it's multifactorial in terms of in terms of what would really help patients in terms of sticking with their CPAP. Let's take a look at the randomized trials. Now, so I told you that it was all very rosy about, um, about again, CPAP compliant patients clearly in, again, observational work have improved blood pressure, vascular events, mortality, but what does the randomized literature show? This is where it's been a little bit more challenging. So I've summarized here again, this is, this is sort of just a grab bag uh, for all the papers that I'm aware of that have been published um, in the past uh, two decades that look at the effect of CPAP after stroke. I'm going to do the same for cardiovascular events as well. Um, and it's very clear that you have multiple improved non-vascular outcomes, such as reduction in depression, improved functional outcomes, a reduction of NIH, improved quality of life, um, reduced daytime sleepy, improved mood. So lots of even cognitive benefits. The challenge though in this area of work, a little bit of the, one of the challenges I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is that not a single trial has shown a difference in vascular outcome with the exception of one that only had 140 people. Um, but the most important trial was the SAVE trial published in 2016 by McAvoy et al. 
and uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine with about almost close to 3,000 patients with stroke and cardiovascular events. And again, that was that was kind of um, that, that, that was a big shock to the field because we thought that with an adequately powered trial, how we'd be able to demonstrate a reduction in mortality, at least a reduction in vascular events. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more because that is something that is near and dear to my heart and something that we should discuss more. And I'd like to share with you my thoughts. In some selected effective cardiovascular trials, um, so in, again, this is after cardiovascular events, not necessarily all the trials that looked at reducing cardiovascular mortality, but after cardiovascular events, here are some, here are three selected trials, again, some of the larger ones. Again, the, um, again, the SAVE trial is in here as well, and there was another one published a couple of years ago as well, and it's the European base. But again, improved non-vascular outcomes like systolic blood pressure, you guys, you can call that kind of vascular, but it's not exactly a direct cardiovascular outcome. Uh, but reduced blood pressure, again, improved daytime sleepiness, quality of life, mood, reduced snoring. Um, but again, no difference in vascular events across all three trials. Now, the last one actually did, after they said that after they adjusted for comorbid um, conditions and compliance and so on, in a sort of a uh, in a postdoc analysis, they demonstrated they demonstrated a reduction in cardiovascular events. Now, some of the limitations of the RCTs today, and some of the limitations of the trials today, are that they've generally had small sample sizes. They may have intervened too late. For example, the SAVE trial um, intervened three months after after someone's event, and uh, generally they had poor CPAP adherence. And this is a big challenge in the field here. One of the biggest problems with the SAFE trial is that they excluded patients with severe daytime sleepiness, um, as well as patients with pretty low nocturnal oxygen saturation. This is probably at least one of the reasons that there was a negative. My own feeling is this is probably one of the reasons it was a negative trial. Now, we have a big challenge in the field here. And the big challenge is that it may not be ethically justifiable to randomize someone who is so sleepy. So if someone has a stroke and they come and see me within a couple of weeks of their event and they're really sleepy and their sleepiness is taking away from their quality of life, I know that I have a treatment, uh, which is CPAP. I know that I have a treatment that can take away their sleepiness and I know I can improve their nocturnal oxygen saturation, improve their quality of life. It would be very hard to randomize an extremely sleepy patient to a control arm that doesn't involve CPAP. So this is one of the challenges in the field and that it may be very, very, very hard at this point to actually do a trial where you know that there's a good therapy for daytime sleepiness, uh, but you don't know if cardiovascular events are gonna be reduced by that or not. So again, just a, just a thought here putting it out there. Another thing is that I know this is, a, this is me, what I do when, I'm, um, when I, I know, can't sleep at night, but I go through the, all the appendices of all those papers. I'm just joking. Uh, but basically this, is, this is basically, this is basically this is on page like 50 something of the appendix of the, uh, of the SAFE trial. But if you actually go, they did a pre-planned one-to-one -one propensity score matching that was used to match CPAP compliers with those from the control arm who would have complied. Okay, so this was pre-planned. Again, we gotta be very careful pulling any positive result out of a post hoc analysis of a negative overall negative trial. But the bottom line is that in this pre-planned propensity matching scheme, if you do look at those who would have complied compared to those who didn't comply, um, you will see that there is actually a reduction in composites. Uh, composite, sorry, in stroke and also composite cerebral events, okay, and that reads statistical significance. Again, got to be very careful taking a positive result out of a uh, out of a post hoc analysis of a negative trial. But again, there is some signal in the noise here that suggests that perhaps stroke events may have been able to be reduced with good CPAP adherence. Okay, and again, that was good good CPAP adherence being that patients use their CPAP for four hours or more. So there's other alternatives as well to treat sleep apnea, such as some medications that are coming on the market, including uh, cannabinoid um, agonists, um, dimethylfumarate, and uh, amoxetine and oxybutynin. And then there's also surgery that's been available, such as hypoglossal nerve stimulation. 
uh, we were fortunate to receive a grant from the Canadian Partnership of, for Stroke Recovery, also supported by Heart and Stroke Foundation. And we're using oral pharyngeal exercises in patients who can't tolerate CPAP. So again, there's different there's different things that are being tried out in this, in this area. So uh, other, in terms of other treatments, uh, and switching away, switching gears now from sleep apnea, in terms of acute insomnia, I really don't want to, I don't really typically in my own practice rely on sleeping pills. You can use them in the short term for maybe two to four weeks maximum, but you really need to address the underlying stressors. So occasionally we'll prescribe someone a sleeping pill if they have surgery the next day or during dealing with an acute stressor but we don't put them on long-term sleeping pills. That's for acute insomnia. For chronic insomnia, it really it basically comes down, this is where I refer on to psychologists or psychiatrists, but basically there is uh, something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, and where patients will establish good behavioral techniques, such as establishing good sleep hygiene. So for example, staying in bed for only seven to eight hours per day. Sometimes patients will spend you know, 20 hours in bed because they think that will help them get more sleep. The bed is only used for sleep time with their partner. Uh, sleeping only when sleepy, getting out of bed after 20 or 30 minutes, um, because that's what we know that, um, that, you know, patients associate the bed with not being able to sleep if they're in the bed for longer times and good sleep hygiene. And then also there's some cognitive things that are addressed, such as addressing anxious and catastrophic thoughts about not getting enough sleep inappropriate expectation about sleep and relaxation techniques that people are before bedtime. Um, here's some advice to all of us for taking call. I personally take post-call days, even though I'm a staff, I don't book a clinic the next day. I make sure I have enough time the next night, or the next day rather, to catch up on my sleep. We, uh, minimum of 11 hours of recovery time, avoid long working hours. It's hard to do, but it's very important. Uh, regularly screen and offer sleep for sleep disorders, prioritize sleep recovery before and after and during uh, work shifts where possible. And outside of, outside, of, um, outside of just what you're doing with sleep, also we should all, who are, but particularly those taking calls, try to maintain a healthy lifestyle. So healthy diet, exercise, exercise particularly exercise in the morning, physical, regular physical activity and avoidance of smoking and excessive alcohol. And again, good sleep hygiene, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So here's some, sorry, actually, we'll talk about it right now. Here's my little ending tips on good sleep hygiene. This is advice that works across the board for lots of different sleeping problems, such simple things that you're probably already aware of, but always important to keep in mind. So try to have eight hours of sleep every day. Try to keep a regular wake and bedtime, I would say plus or minus, you know, plus or minus 30 minutes. So have always, go to bed every day, always the same time. Try to wake up every day at more or less the same time as well. Bedroom should be dark, quiet, a little cool. The research has shown that a cool bed, you sleep better and have, it's a little bit better for your health. Uh, finish eating a couple hours before bedtime. That makes sense for digestive reasons. Avoid caffeine, at least within six hours of bedtime. I, I usually say just don't take any caffeine after you. So maybe you take your noon coffee and the coffee and that's it. Avoid alcohol within a couple hours of bedtime. And again, I told you that story of the patient who actually stopped drinking at night and his sleep apnea went away. Uh, stop smoking if you do. Yeah, so this is a controversial area where looking at screens before bedtime, probably I would say don't look at any screens in bed because they could really, really affect your ability to fall asleep. And I tell patients to avoid using electronics and really any work related materials in their bedroom. And, uh, but again, even looking at screens in bed can associate the bed with no longer being uh, for sleep, but rather for, for, uh, for entertainment or for watching movies or whatnot. Uh, exercise regularly, always beneficial. Uh, bedroom should only be for sleep as discussed before. And again, work materials, computers, TVs, you don't want the bedroom to be associated at all with anything work related. Relaxation techniques. So some uh, people will have a warm shower, some people will do massage and so on and so forth. Anything that will help relax you before bed. Avoid sleep on your back. So this is a little trick that my mentor at Sunnybrook, Dr. Murray taught me is that 
You can have a little shirt that has a breast pocket. Usually the breast pocket is obviously at the front, but you can put a tennis ball in the breast pocket and then wear the shirt backwards so that you, if you accidentally roll on your back, you get a little nudge again. So you wear, basically put a tennis ball in the breast pocket and wear the shirt, uh, and then wear that shirt backwards. You can also raise the head of your bed by sleeping on more than one pillow. Um, again, as we discussed before, if you can't sleep, go to bed within 20 minutes. Sorry, if you, if you can't fall asleep within 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes, get out of bed, do something boring and try to go to bed again, all right? Something that probably many of us do is you probably make lists or, or organize yourself before you go to bed. And I think that's a good idea. If you have worries or things that you have to do, you have to take care of, you can just sort of arrange your week by making a list of things, writing them down, keeping everything organized so you don't carry these thoughts uh, with you into bed. And that's it. So thank you very much for your time. Just to conclude then, sleep apnea is an independent risk factor for vascular events and vascular risk factors as is disrupted sleep architecture. There's a lot of accurate methods and convenient cost-effective ambulatory methods to detect sleep disorders. There are a lot of benefits to treating sleep apnea after vascular events, such as improving daytime sleepiness, recovery, cognition, mood, overall quality of life. However, no randomized trials have demonstrated a reduction of vascular events or mortality with CPAP use. And as discussed just over the past few minutes, uh, there are strategies to overcome the potentially harmful effects of sleep fragmentation, shift work, and insomnia. So thank you very much for your time. I also want to acknowledge the large crew that I have the pleasure of working with and collaborating with at Sunnybrook and abroad Canada and the world. And uh, thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take questions right now. Thank you very much, Mark. That was an excellent presentation. Um, you have a huge following, and they've stayed with you the entire time, so that's amazing. Uh, we do have some. We do have several questions for you, so I'll get started. First of all, a simple one. Can you just clarify when you said 70% 70, 70 of stroke patients have sleep apnea? Is that before their stroke or after? It's a great question. It's actually after their stroke. It's very. It would be very hard to gauge before their stroke, of course, because if we knew they have a stroke, we would do everything possibly to to prevent it. So, um, so yeah. So it's after their stroke. Probably many of them also had it before their stroke as well, and that, and that was an independent risk factor to develop the stroke. Great. Another question that's um, challenging for people and confusing. When you said that the study showed greater than six hours of sleep plus a nap had negative result, have negative effects on you, whereas less than six plus a nap was positive. Most patients who have had a heart condition or stroke who go home do sleep longer at night and do need nap naps through the recovery process. Is that putting them at greater risk of having another event? No, I don't think so because uh, right after stroke or right after a cardiovascular event, patients need more sleep. So I wanna be clear that that would be like in a general population, okay? Where where patients, where, where the person's not dealing with any acute medical issue at that time, but stroke, often we have patients with post-stroke fatigue who will need many weeks, sometimes even months, of additional rest and it's the same with the cardiovascular population where additional sleep with those acute medical stressors is actually I'd say is appropriate and probably needed. Now if it goes on for a long time, if it goes on for years, and it's very hard to set a cutoff for one as long time, but if it goes on uh, longer than that, one really should get checked out for sleep apnea. Why is more sleep necessary in those cases? Great, thank you. Um, several people have sent in questions related to access to sleep studies and when they are appropriate and not. So one question is asked, a couple of people have said they have zero access or very long, long waiting lists. Another question asks, should patients in inpatient stroke rehabilitation or cardiac rehabilitation centers routinely get assessed for sleep apnea while they're there? Yeah, so, um, so I think in terms of access, it's a big challenge. And this is why I'm trying to push through different talks and also, um, trying to advocate, you know, discussing with at the government level and Ontario Medical Association level, um, uh, you know, we should make sleep testing more accessible because it's easy to do. And as I've demonstrated already, it can be done through the home, through the home sleep apnea tests or actigraphy even. And when interpreted by an experienced physician, uh, these could be of great benefit to a large number of people. So that might address at least in part, part of the access issue. Should all patients be addressed? Uh, should be tested for sleep, uh, for sleep apnea? I think that is correct. I think it should be, and some stroke units 
actually already do that. So I know Trauma Rehab had at least uh, a dozen. I, I think I think they continue to do so. They've published some nice work on this as well, as we have at Sunnybrook with my research crew. But basically, yes, I would advocate for testing for um, for for sleep problems on these different vascular units uh, because they can help improve clinical outcomes. It ends up being a resource issue. And that's one of the challenges. But again, more using more ambulatory approaches may actually help facilitate that. Great, thank you very much. Um, do we have a sense of timing for when the home sleep apnea tests will be available and how quickly and by whom do they get read? Yeah, so they need to be read just like, so when you do a full and lab study, like the level ones I discussed, they get reviewed by a sleep technologist and then signed off by a sleep physician who basically creates the report. For the home sleep apnea test, they also need to be reviewed manually by some sort of, by an expert who's familiar with tracing and, and so on and so forth. But they can be done, they can be, they can be done, uh, they can be reported much more quickly. And sorry, they can be both scored and reported much more quickly. Uh, how quickly, you know, so it can make things a little bit more efficient in that regard. Uh, in terms of, no, the main holdup right now, as I mentioned before, is that the government does not support them in many parts across Canada, and that's the limitation right now. And so it's unfortunately what people are not, um, what people um, cannot support. Like I can't hire, a, I can't open up my lab and, uh, and have it supported by home tests because I will not have any money to support my, uh, my technologist or something, which would be very unfortunate. Here's a good one for you. Some people are naturally early risers and some are naturally people who work late into the night. Right. Is there a higher risk or a difference um, in time you go to bed and, and your risk of sleep apnea or events due to it? Yeah, so every one of us has their own intrinsic um, circadian rhythm basically. So there's a natural time that each and every one of us is comfortable to go to bed and to wake up. And that usually is gonna be separated by about seven or eight hours, usually, uh, most people. Um, so if you're someone, so initial work has suggested that you know all CEOs go to bed, like I don't know, they wake up early and they go to bed early and they wake up early and so on and so forth. But other work has shown that in fact, even someone who stays up really, really, really late at night and sleeps in a little bit compared to everyone else, um, uh, they can be just as successful and, and just as productive. So. Um, so I think, again, everyone falls in a natural cycle. It's a matter of knowing when your best bedtime is, when your best waking up time is, and that should usually be around eight hours, generally speaking. Sometimes it's be a little less, sometimes it might be a little bit more. But it, no, but it doesn't impact overall. Like if you're going to bed at like three in the morning every day and waking up at 11, compared to going to bed every day at know, nine and waking up you know, seven or eight hours later, it, should, it doesn't impact your overall success. Great. So you mentioned um, devices for sleep apnea for, by a dentist. It, what is the rate of success of these devices? And are there specialized dentists that you have to get referrals to? That's right. Yeah. So if you see a, special, a sleep specialist, they can refer you to a sleep dentist. And as I said, I work with just a handful of dentists across all of Toronto because I know that they're the ones who will fit these things uh, and do a very, very, very good job. Um, so these, these are what we call dental appliances or mandibular advancement devices. One of their challenges is that if people don't have insurance, they, they can be quite costly. They might be a thousand or two thousand dollars. You'd have to check with the individual dentist. But yes, they have to be fitted from a uh, you know they have to be fitted by a professional uh, professional in this area. And I've had some patients where they could not tolerate CPAP. They did gloriously well on um, on uh, on um, you know using the mandibular advancement device, and we're very 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 happy with it. Success rates vary across different dentists, though, but they can be, you know, it, it, I would it probably would be good to know for specific dentists what the success rate is for them. Hard to get those stats, usually about, I would say, 50 to 75 percent uh, success rate. So it's not 100 percent, but um, but there's a pretty high success rate, particularly in patients. I remember, these are people usually who couldn't tolerate other means like CPAP or other approaches. Great. Thank you. And another question is. For people who get up frequently during the night to go to the bathroom, is those interruptions in sleep put them at higher risk and are, would that be associated with sleep apnea? It could be, yeah. So one thing that I didn't put this in my slides, but 
waking up to go use the washroom a lot can actually be a sli uh, it could be a sign of sleep apnea and it's underappreciated because everyone always especially in men they blame their prostate and uh and so on which it can be prostate issues too but if someone is waking up repeatedly throughout the night they should be tested for sleep apnea uh because sleep apnea could be just waking them up and uh, fragmenting their sleep and yes for, I, I didn't show these slides but fragmented sleep has been shown to uh to be linked with poor clearance of toxins in the brain and that in itself can increase the risk of stroke heart attack also things like dementia and death thank you what are your preferred pharmacological recommendations for helping with sleep onset and sleep maintenance and at what point would you start to order um, pharmacotherapy yeah so there has to be an identified acute um acute acute stressor and so like surgery grievance like something big and not just uh you know day-to-day -day work or my life is stressful or whatever there has to be an acute stress. So I actually personally, I know it's going to sound very bad, but I don't actually prescribe sleeping pills almost ever. Um, and in the law and in the short term, maybe I, you know, one could prescribe just a few, um, like a, only a few days worth or a week or two's worth of them. The guidelines stretched out the full weeks. I practically have never done that before. So things like there's different ones on the market, like Zolpidem or, or, um, or Ativan, or also known as, also known as Lorazepam. Again, in the short term, it probably doesn't, Hurt. For example, say you're, God forbid, in the hospital or, or just having dealing with surgery or something like that, probably doesn't hurt, hurt again in the short run. But the problem is that, and the main issue is that when these are chronically used, it becomes a major issue for patients. Great. Two more questions for you, and then we'll let you off the hook for the day. How useful are the actigraphy data to guide clinical practice? Yeah, it's a great question. I thought someone was going to ask about commercial ones like Fitbit and stuff like that. So I'm sort of maybe I'll tie in the two uh, answers together or the two issues together. So actigraphy is fairly accurate um, compared to in laboratory polysomnography. However, there are some limitations to it. One of them is that if you're lying still in bed, uh, while while polysomnography can tell whether you're sleeping or not because it has EEG channels on you, so it can actually it's reading your brain waves. These ones, uh, these wrist actigraphy and other similar things like, a, you know, an app you might put beside like your iPhone, if you put it or your, your, your smartphone, if you put it beside your bed and there's little apps that detect your sleep stages, they don't know if you're lying still. They don't know if you're asleep or if you're awake. So while these actigraphs are usually fairly accurate for overall sleep and overall wake, they will not be able to pick up um, things like light sleep or 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 lying in bed, uh, but not actually sleeping. So they're not going to be 100% accurate, but they can tell you the big things. They're not going to tell you the nitty gritty of which sleep stages you likely are in, or or or, or with any degree of major accuracy. But they're getting better over the time, and these commercial devices have actually improved over the years uh, to a fair degree. So again, they're not like medical grade quality right now, but they're really going in the right direction. And uh, I think they can tell you about big problems you may have with your sleep, but the nitty gritty stuff, like particularly sleep stages, uh, intrinsic sleep disorders that may be underlying, may be hard to tell from that. So now, if you have one of these devices and it tells you your sleep is great, but you're waking up every morning feeling awful or really have choppy sleep, regardless of what the device is telling you, you should go and get checked out by a sleep specialist. Great, final question for you. So at Heart and Stroke over the last couple of years, we've been heavily um, promoting um, differences in sex and gender in, in our conditions of heart disease and stroke. In terms of sleep apnea, are there differences between males and females? And how strong is that evidence and in what aspects of sleep disorders or sleep challenges? You stole my next research paper that I'm going to assign to students. So basically, it's it's sex differences are so and gender differences are so important to to look into. And I actually have I have multiple projects lined up actually in this area because I think it's so important. Um, so overall, I mean, we already discussed men tend to have a little bit more sleep apnea, but the presentation is different. So this has been an area, Patty, that I've been super interested in, but I just started reading about now more recently over the last year or so. Um, but it may very well be that the, the presentations in men and female differ, and, and I've seen some sleep. Again, there's actually surprisingly there's been very little little research done in this area. 
um, where um, where females may present a little bit more atypically compared to men. You know, like men might be the more obese snoring guys, but women may present with other things more like fatigue, but not so much snoring and so on and so forth. So again, very exciting area. I have projects in the works uh, to look at this. We have the data in the Centerbrook Sleep Lab. If anybody actually wants to collaborate, please reach out and I'd be thrilled to, to collaborate. And, um, but yeah, a super important area and I fully support that, 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 that work. So thank you. Great, we look forward to seeing those results because that is a very important area for us. Absolutely. At this point, I'd like to thank you immensely for a very informative, excellent presentation. Um, you generated a ton of questions from people. You kept everybody's interest to the end. Um, I'd also like to say to everybody out there that's participated today, thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking a little bit of time out of these incredibly busy days in our unprecedented times. We thank all of you, all of our healthcare providers, especially our frontline workers, for all of um, the efforts you're making to look after patients who are dealing with COVID and those who aren't. I'd like to remind everybody, continue to remind your patients and people you encounter that stroke, heart attacks, cardiac arrest are still medical emergencies. We've seen decreased numbers and we really want everybody um, to continue to remind people that those are medical emergencies and do need to present to hospital right away and not delay. So again, thank you to everybody for all you're doing. Um, we greatly appreciate your efforts. We greatly appreciate you joining us today. And that concludes today's session. Thank you.